Jim with CyberEcon, welcome. Talking to you today about more about your security career progression, talking about getting you ready for the Security Plus certification exam. This morning we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about improper error handling and improper input handling. All right, so let's let's jump in. Let's move over to slide decks and talk a little bit about them. So this is part of domain one. It's actually area 1.6. And we're really talking about comparing and contrasting types of attacks. In this one, we're talking about vulnerabilities. And the vulnerability we're talking about specifically is improper error handling, right? So what we're talking about is as a programmer, as a coder, as a developer of software, to make your software work, normally you're going to have to get input from the user. It could be simple things like names, birth dates, addresses, quantity of something ordered. There's a field that the user has to fill out or has to select from, and that's going to be put back into the program, right? So improper error handling is the number one source of application vulnerabilities. And this is a cause of a long list of things, and some of them are listed on the screen here. Buffer overflows, injection attacks, canonical attacks, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, all kinds of attacks come from improper error handling. And really what the attackers want to do is the attackers want to use that input field to manipulate values, to manipulate the back end of the system, to make it do the things it wants to do. So as an application developer, we want to make sure that we only allow specific types of input into input boxes, right? Uh, it should be restricted as much as possible. So if we know a name is going into a field, Maybe we want to make sure there's no special characters there. Maybe we want to make sure that it's only 20 or 25 characters long. We want to check it when it comes through. So when it comes through, strip out code. If there's code in there, we want to make sure that it's taken out. Unless for some reason you have an input field that code is going through. So what we want to make sure is that the input area, say the input box for a text field, is only taking types of information that should be going through there. So it's easy to say, hey, we'll set up an input box and we'll make it just whatever size that is the default. And that may be 20,000 characters. So if you have a name field that's 20,000 characters, that's dangerous. If we don't check it for code going through, then the attacker can do things like cross-site scripting or better yet, SQL injection can add SQL commands into the input and then maybe take over the backend database. So we want to make sure that when our developers are developing applications, developing websites, developing things like that, when they have a place that has a opportunity for a user to put input into the program, especially free form text like names, addresses, things like that, we want to check it, make sure that it's being validated if it's names, you probably don't need special characters in there. Don't allow special characters. If it's only numbers, if it's maybe a phone number, only allow the numbers 0 through 9. Get rid of everything else. If we know it's a social security number, make sure that it's only 9 characters long. You don't need more than that, right? So we just want to put some restrictions around what we do with input handling, right? So our defenses, we wanted to have input validation. We want to limit the input size. And then you know, it's the secondary thing, but patch your systems. The systems that are running, make sure they're patched because if somebody does break through and is able to manipulate the backend system. We want to make sure there's as little vulnerabilities on that thing as possible. So the big thing with, with this input handling, it's going to be where the end user is adding something to the program. They're putting their input in there, names, addresses, phone numbers quantity of something ordered. If you can make it, uh, force it into a drop-down field, that's even better. Then they can only pick from the drop-down. If it's radio buttons or check buttons, even better. But we know there's some places, a username, you're not going to have the ability to put all usernames in there. So you're going to have to allow freeform text. Maybe it's a place that has notes or comments. Make sure that those are the same thing. Make sure we're doing input handling. So we want to make sure we're checking the input and we're not allowing characters in that shouldn't be coming in through that input stream. Because that's really, that's where things are going to go bad. So that is our first stop along the way. 
And when we talk about that, that is really programming 101. It's, it's basic code hygiene, right? The next thing we want to talk about is error handling. So what happens if something goes wrong with your application as it's running? What, so, what happens if something goes wrong with your website when it's running? So and that's what we're talking about here. And again, this is a part of domain one. This is part of 1.6, and this is improper error handling. So in this, we're talking about what is displayed when the application encounters an error, right? And by default, a lot of times, Errors are echoed right onto the screen. And I'm sure you've seen this. When something goes wrong, you go to a website that go to connect to something in the back end application sends you a screen that says, you know, my PHP something something. It's gonna say something on the screen. Uh, SQL database error. Something comes up on the screen, version, you know, 4.5 or something. Uh, that information, any information you give back to the end user can be used against you. So as an application developer again, or as the security person that's maintaining the security of those applications, we want to make sure that the developers, programmers, make sure that we're suppressing these error screens from the end user. They're really good for debugging the program. If the program, we're building the program, we want to make sure the program works right. Sometimes we have to have these error screens pop up when the developer is working on it. It's easy for it to be displayed on the screen. You're going to want that that makes sense so they can debug the program and get it working right the problem is the bad guy the attacker is going to do the same thing the information that's displayed on the screen is going to tell them where the problem is in the program it's going to tell them where the application broke or it's going to tell them specific information what type of database is being used what type of connectors are being used what type of applications are being used what's the version of the server the things running on any information they get from error screen is going to help them move their attack forward. So the best thing we can do is take those error messages and send them to a log. And we're going to log them and we're going to send them maybe off the server somewhere else so that people can review the logs to make sure things are running right. Once we get those logs, make sure they're protected, right? We want to encrypt them and then we want to put access control lists or ACLs on them. So the bad guy, if they do get on the machine, they can't go in the log and just read the log or delete the log which would help in covering the tracks, right? You know, this is why it's bad. We talked about a lot of this. Tells the attacker the type and version of software applications. Tells the location of errors. Tells the attacker the process that have stopped or started during the attack or during the error. Sometimes it tells pro programmatic errors, like the error is on line 572. Data structures are, are sometimes displayed and other information about the inner workings of the system. We really want to do suppression of error messages. We don't want them being displayed to the end user. Put them in a log file, protect the log file, and have people review the log file, not waiting for the message to be displayed on screen. In development, sure. If you're in development, have the error messages come up, have the developers work with that. But before you go live into production, before the end users are using this thing, suppress those messages, send them to a log file. So that's the rundown. That's the two we went over this morning. I know we spent a little bit of time getting through the news of the day today. That's just the way it is. But as always, I'm Jim with Cyber Recon. Hope you're doing well. Hope things are going well. Like, comment, subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified when new things come out. Would love you to share this with your friends if they want to get their lowdown on cybersecurity. In any case, be safe out there, and we will see you next time.